I think Scott Satterfield has a chance to do something really special with this offense in 2023. Hey, thanks so much for making it done. Eric Cats, your first piece of every day. It's free and available everywhere that you get your podcasts, including right here on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe and follow our YouTube channel to get an alert every time we drop. And you have to, excuse me, on Lockdown Bearcats. Thank your host each and every day right here on Lockdown Bearcats. Hold Lockdown Podcast number 14 every day. As you can see, you're listening to this or watching this on Monday. I recorded this last legacy NCAA tournament in between games. So at the time of this recording, I didn't know who won the second game. You do listening or watching do this. So that is what we are doing to kick off the week here in Lockdown Bearcats. We're going to talk some football with Scott Saverfield and the Bearcats offense in 2023. Look, I think it has a chance to be really good. He's had some success as a play caller in the past in key moments, Scott Saverfield. His offenses have been good in his first seasons as a head man at the FBS level. Let's look at 2014 for Appalachian State. The Mountaineers were 26 in score in the country, they averaged 241 rushing yards per game, eight times they crossed 200 or more rushing yards. They even hit 441 and 469 in back-to-back weeks, eight times they eclipsed 400 plus yards of offense. And even in 2013, this first season of the Hell, when the Mountaineers only won four and eight, that was their final season of Division Two. 2014 was their first in Division One. They went seven to five and fourteen. But in 2013, they went from one and six to four and eight. That's going three and two over the last five games. Only one time did they hit 200 plus yards rushing, but eight times they hit 200 plus yards of offense. Now, you might say, well, 2013 he struggled, and yes, he did, but he did really well in 20 in 2014, and then from 2015 through 2018 on, his worst season, the Mountaineers' worst season was nine and four. They went 11 and 2 in 2015 in their first season of bowl eligibility. They won their they won their bowl game. So what's clear is, given time, Satterfield can be a really good head coach. Again, don't look at what the numbers suggest in Louisville. 25 and 24 is not a reflection of him. It's a reflection of the issues that were going on with the athletic department. And as I documented last week. The athletic department and the football program are on much more stable ground at the University of Cincinnati. Never having fewer than nine wins in a four-year span. I don't care what level of football you're coaching at. Power 5, G5, FBS, FCS, that's really good. 2019 in Louisville, his first season with them. Eight times they hit 200 more rushing yards. Eight times they hit 400 more yards of offense. And all of this is evidence as to why I'm really confident in what this offense can look like. And it may not be great this year. Over time, I think it will be really good. And I was walking into a five job. But the unique thing about Cincinnati is they have been good at recruiting for years leading up to their power five appearance. This is a really good program when it comes to recruiting. And it all goes back to how we talk about playing for the program, not the coach. That's what I think about here. The Bearcats are going to have the opportunity to be really good on offense because of the players they have. Quarterback, whether that's Emory Jones or Ben Bryant or Brady Drogosh or maybe Evan Prater, they have the pieces of running back tight ends with potential to Shemont Mateo. They have some interesting receivers in guys who haven't had a lot of play time and guys who have entered from the transfer portal. But that's what I think about here. And next year, this year, 2023, it might be a down year set by recent standards. Just like Satterfield, his worst season in a four-year span, his final four seasons at Appalachian State was nine and four. The Bearcats, the last five seasons, their worst season was a nine and four season when they won nine games, were playing for a conference championship berth and to host the game in the final week of the season. And we know they have we know they can go eleven and two or three or thirteen and one excuse me because of what this program can do with high enough caliber players. And there are still a lot of them here. And you combine that excuse me, with better resources and a more solid foundation. I'm telling you, 
Based off what Satterfield has done with offenses in the past, and in first seasons at the FBS, at App State, and at Louisville, by the end of this season, this team will be hitting its stride offensively. Whatever that means is to be seen. If that means they go off a five-game win streak to go to nine to three, great. If it means they go from let's say three and five to seven and five or six and six and get them eligible, yeah, that's good too. But what's interesting is that is remains to be seen, and that does that does make the start of the season really important. You want to position yourself to where you can make that stretch run, and you can have the opportunity to to make a bowl game for the 14th time in 17 seasons. But I'm optimistic to come after the bye. We will see a really good offense. All right, coming up, there was a problem at Louisville. It wasn't Saturday's offense. I'll tell you what that problem is, and if that will carry over here coming up. But first, got to tell you about Bill Paul. This is the best time of the year we are in knee deep into March Madness. And the Bill March Madness bracket is here. We know you are off, and now is your time. To make a count, go to marchmadness.com to vote for your favorites. You know, I'll be voting for the cookie dough chunk puff. And if you want whoever you want to win the NCAA tournament, whoever to win the NCAA tournament to win, then you'll be voting for that bar too, or puff in this case. Support your team, support your bar or puff. And when you vote for your favorite bar or puff, you'll be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky locked on listeners will get a free box of built. Not only that, but locked on. A one locked on fan will win a 12 month subscription to Bill to have Bill's best bars or puffs delivered right to your door. You've got to try Bill. Bill is the best protein bar ever. Seriously, the so protein, low in sugar, and they're covered with 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. One of Bill's Marchmadness.com right now to vote for your favorite pork pick. All right, moving on to segment two here. I got a laptop here, so. Came undone, but that's okay. Now we got some power back, so that's good. Alex Frank back with you, your host, right here on our Lockdown Podcast number 14. Remember, this is what I get for recording and covering the NCAA. But what's interesting to me about Louisville in the four seasons, that they were without, or they were with rather Scott Satterfield, is it wasn't Satterfield's offenses that were the problem. The problem was the defense. And you're thinking, well, Brian Brown and Louisville's defense last year is really good, but if you go back and you look at the the 2019 to 2021 Louisville Cardinals, and the reason why they lost a lot of games is not because of the offense or Satterfield's play calling, it was because their defense couldn't stop the opposing offense. They were in a lot of high-scoring games. If you look at 2019, Brian Brown's defense in 2019 gave up 200-plus rushing yards six times, including 517, eight times they gave up 400-plus yards offense. And you look at some of the scores from that 2019 team. If you look at some of the scores, were 30th in the country offense. They were 100th in score defense. And look at some of the scores. 17, 35, 24, 45, 10, 39, and 62, 59. 62, 59. They lost 52, 27, 45, 13. They give up 34 points in a 56, 34 win against Syracuse. Go back to 2020. Some of the scores from that season, they lost 46-27, Again, a lot of high score that year, so it improved, but still give up a lot of points. Then they dipped back to 77. In 2021, they lost 43-24. They lost 37-34, 34-33. 52-21, and then 30 28. So again, the way in 2020 and 2021, according to the Timbers, wow. 2020, they gave up 200 plus rushing yards three times, 400 plus yards of offense five times. 
In 2021, they gave up 300. They gave up 200 plus yards rushing three times, 400 plus yards offense eight times. But look at 2022 last year. Five times they held opponents under 100 yards rushing. Four times under 300 yards of offense. And only one time did Louisville's defense under Brian Brown give up 200 more rushing yards after week two. Only one time after week two. The scoring. They were 11, 19 points, points per game. Look at some of these scores. They gave up 14. I mean, go from week when they beat Virginia after starting two and three. They gave up 17, 10, 21, 10. Yeah, they got 31 to Clemson. 10, 26 to Kentucky. And only seven to Cincinnati. So this is a really good defense that Louisville had last season. And am I worried that the first three seasons are going to carry over here to Cincinnati? A little bit. I mean, the Big 12, we know how good of offenses they have. They're dynamic. They can run. They can pass. They can score. Sorry for my allergy. But there are some really talented on this defense. And key guys are back who missed those two games at the end of last season against Tulane and Louisville. You have experience on the D line. Worried about the rush defense, even with the offenses. My worry is the secondary because I don't know who's going to start. I don't know who's going to emerge the playmaker. Because yes, we're going to lose Sauce and Kobe, but you're also losing now this year turnover machines and Javon Hicks and Arquan Bush. So how do you guys like Brian Threats or Morgan Smith or and? You know, Sammy Anderson, Taj Moore. How do those guys make up for it? You know, can they hold up against the past electric offense in the Big 12? That's what I'm worried about the most. And I think Brian Brown is going to be a good addition for Bearcats' defense program. There's one thing that I like about Satterfield's coaching staff. It has to account him seven assistants from Louisville. And Gary Combs and Walter Stewart, who on last year's staff made the team. Those are all huge. All right, coming up, I'm going to give you my takeaways from the. And I've got something really interesting that's going to explain. All right, I'm going to explain to you why so many upsets that more than ever. I'll get into that after I tell you all why this episode or how, excuse me, this episode of Lockdown Bearcats brought to you by FanDuel Sports. The tournament is heating up, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel. New customers get a no sweat first, but up to one. That's bonus bets back if your first doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy on everything from the money line to point scores and free straight plus. FanDuel even lets you combine your best for a chance and a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets and bonus bets. When you go to fanduelcom slash lockdown. That's fanduelcom slash lockdown to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. And I guess since they mentioned the tournament, March Madness. What a weekend! The first weekend of the NCAA tournament. Columbus was fantastic hosting it. Really enjoyed uh, being on press row, beating guys like Kevin Kugler and Jordan Cornette, Cincinnati native, and seeing Justin Williams, the athletic Petralia of CLNS, who you, who you will see it here on this show tomorrow, by Petralia of CLNS Media. But my takeaways from the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. Obviously, the big story, fairly Dickinson, right here in Columbus, pulling off the upset and beating Purdue excuse me, Friday night. The second 16th seed to ever win against the one seed in the NCAA tournament. And it got me thinking, you know, should we be shocked in her when we see an upset like this, a 16th seed? Beat a one seed or a 15 beat a two, as was the case of Princeton beating Arizona. Or last year when St. Peter's beat Kentucky. Maybe you were because that's Kentucky and they never lose the first round like that. 
But should we be shocked when something like that happens? It's now the second time the 16 has beaten the 1. And for me, given all the upsets I've seen since 2010, you know, going back to when Northern Iowa beat Kansas, or even when VCU made their final four run, or Florida Gulf Coast made it to the Sweet 16, or Oral Roberts and St. Peter's in their runs, I don't think we should be shocked at it. And what it proves is seeds don't matter. And it also doesn't matter where you play. Selection Sunday used to be to see what seeds you were. And if you were a one seed prior to 2018, that was an automatic win. If you were a two seed, yes, it was still a win, but not as automatic. And then as you went further down the seed lines, that creates more of an equal match. It used to be, well, what's your 5-12 flip? Now it's, hmm, can that 14 seed be the three seed? And then there are times you think, well, that 15-2 match, I think it's going to be a little closer than some expect. Well, now you got to ask yourself, is it a cinch that the one going to automatically go to the Sweet 16? The answer. And what's also standing out to me is, look at they're not irrelevant. They, you know who they are. You know who Fairleigh Dickinson is. Now, Fairleigh Dickinson, fun fact, prior to tip-off last night, at the time of this recording, had three NCAA tournament wins. NKU, you know who NKU is? They're a Cincinnati school. Northern Kentucky, Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky. All right. So, Howard, you know who Howard is. You know who Texas Southern is. They've been in the tournament like five times in the last seven years. You know who, maybe you didn't know who Southeast Missouri State or Texas a and Corpus Christi were, but your 16 seeds are becoming much more relevant now. Look at your 15 seeds. You know who Princeton is. Princeton is a very noteworthy school. Similar to Vermont. You know who Vermont is? They're a dynasty. They've won a tournament game before. They beat Syracuse in 05. You also know... Excuse me. You also know... Who's the two-seeded? Excuse me. Kansas region bus. You also know who UNC Asheville is. Then you go up to Houston's region. And Colgate... You know about them. Yeah, since now he knows about them. What I'm saying is, lower seats are no longer relevant. And, and, and you could say that a three seat, that a, you know, fairly negative to every three wins might be attributed to the fact that they've played in the first four. But that's just the way it goes. But here's something else that's interesting to me. You know why there's so many upsets? I think it's the advent of social media. And look at the big schools. They're the most prevalent. They have a lot of exposure. And in the social media age, this isn't slowing down anytime soon. That's added weight, pressure, and expectations. And the hardest thing to do and Luke Fickle always talked about this, is keeping 18 and 22 year olds focused. And think about March Madness, the greatest tournament in American sports. It is trending on Twitter every single day for three weeks. Every athlete, or most of them I would say, have Instagram for Twitter and or Twitter. Think about what they see. Think about the weight that friends and family and outside sources put on them. And you think about the weight and expectations, especially in a big school where there's history and expectations already there. Purdue, Kansas, Duke, Kentucky, Michigan State. All teams who have been bitten by upsets in years past. The small schools have nothing to worry about. They lose. Fine, they were supposed to lose. They were just supposed to be there. 
team like Purdue loses like they did Friday night here, it's all over social media. You can't escape it. It can be hard to focus with weight and expectations already there because of this who you play for, and the weight and expectations put on you by social media that your friends and family are on. That's why we're seeing a lot of upsets. Duke has been bitten by it several times. Kentucky was bit by it last year. Kansas has been bit by it several times, actually. Michigan State got hit in 2015, or 16. And then you have other schools like Ohio State, Arizona, Georgetown in 2013 against Florida Gulf Coast. And for what it's worth, it doesn't dance. If it mattered where you play the games, then explain to me Princeton going to Sacramento and winning against Arizona. Or Norfolk State going to Omaha and beating Missouri. It really does not matter where you play games. All selection Sunday now is to see if you made the tournament and who you're playing and where. And it doesn't matter where. It does not matter where. What matters is winning that first game. It's March. Anything can happen. If you're not with it for one day, 40 minutes, you're, you're in grave, grave danger. And that's why I used to say the hardest games to win in the tournament on the first weekend. Really, it's now the first game. The first game is the hardest to win because of all the chaos that's happening around you. When you focus on your game, and it can be hard to do because we have 16 games a day for two days, and there's upsets happening all around you. Can you focus on your game? That's the question. And it's becoming harder and harder on social media. Go back to 09. The biggest upset of that tournament was Cleveland State over Wake Forest. But your regional final matchups, you had two 3 1 matchups and two 1 2 matchups. Your regional final matchups, you had five versus two, four versus two. Ten versus one, and then fifteen versus eight. You wonder why that is? Because it's about which team you walk in for three weeks. It's not the best team. It's which is the team that plays the best on any given day, six, six or seven consecutive times. And that's why we're seeing Blue Bloods get upset. No team. Not Duke, not Kentucky, not Kansas. Not even Villanova. No team is safe in the month of March. That's why there's a lot of upsets. Now, over the weekend, if you're in the first week of an upset that any of you Bearcats fans want to forget, I'm going to give in and into it for a little bit, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to play the what-if game. I don't like playing the what-if game, but I'm going to hear that in just moments. Our Locked On Bearcats, your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, apparently in the intro video doesn't want to work today, but that's okay. So, Saturday was the fifth year anniversary of UC Nevada. And I remember that game. I was at that game. What's interesting is where the program has gone since then. And what if they had won that game? And the thing about that game is, I thought it was going to be close going in. I did not think the Bearcats were going to be up by 22. It felt weird, but I also felt like, okay, they can cruise the rest of the way. And for a while, 
it looked like that was going to be the case. Until Nevada mounted a comeback. And by the time you knew what was happening, you couldn't even think about it. You didn't have time because you knew what was happening. Nevada was going to win the game. What if the Bearcats... What if they win that game? They go on to play Loyola Chicago in the Sweet 16. A rematch of the 93 national title game. Do they win? I don't know. To this day, I say they don't. Because Loyola played a very similar style to Cincinnati. I think it would have been very interesting to see what would have happened if they did. Because the bracket was wide open. Virginia had lost, Tennessee had lost, Kentucky would later lose to Kansas State. Sorry for my allergies. It would have been very easy for Cincinnati to, if they beat Loyola, I think they would have beaten Kansas State and played for a Final Four. Their bracket was wide open. And it would have validated a lot of the previous years of failures in the tournament. And instead, that's what this program is still defined by. If they make the Sweet 16 that year, yes, it's only their third since 1996. But they would have got, but Mick Cronin, his best team, would have realized its potential. But what it also goes to show you is, with all the chaos that surrounds the first weekend of the tournament, how hard it is to get out of it. Once you get to the Sweet 16, it's a reset. Now, the games are obviously very intense. Look at Purdue, Virginia. Look at Purdue, Tennessee. Look at UCLA, Gonzaga. Look at any Sweet 16 game that you've seen over the years. It's been really good. What's interesting to me, though, is Cincinnati had a wide-open chance. And instead, the same failures that have defined this program for as good as it's been since 1991 are still there. Would Mick Cronin still be here? I do think he would have gotten an extension if he, if the Bearcats had advanced out of the second round. I really do. Because that was their sixth straight year of a first or second round exit. And I also think ever since then, it's been, you look back at that. And how it was a missed opportunity. I think you look at what happened since. A first round exit, we don't know what would have happened in 2020, and then three straight years missing the tournament. And when you have stuff like that happen, you go back to your last chance you had to really do something special, and that was 2018. We did that with the Bengals in 2015 when they lost to Pittsburgh. How would feel if they had if they had just got to the Sweet 16? The Elite Eight. Or maybe the the final four. Instead, it's been the same old, same old. You wonder if Mick Cronin would still be here. And then Samari Curtis, what kind of player would they have had in him? Would Logan Johnson have stayed more than one year? Would Nasir Brooks have stayed post-2019? We don't know. It's altered the course of this program. For a long time, was can this program get out of the first weekend? Now it's can they make the tournament. They've only played in one tournament game since then, and they lost right here at Nationwide Arena. I was at that game. It's a loss that still haunts me to this day, and I'm sure it haunts you to this day. But until the Bearcats get to the Sweet 16 or an Elite 8 or a Final Four, it's going to stay with you. Just like the playoff loss to Pittsburgh. And unfortunately, it did for five years. And if you're a Reds fan, same with the 2012 season. All right, that's going to do it for me today here on Lockdown Bearcats. Thanks so much for making us your first listen every day. How about your second listen? Check out our brand new podcast, Lockdown College Basketball Experts, Isaac Shade and Andy Patton. Bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. Lockdown College Basketball available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. I'm on Twitter at Frankie underscore Natty with two N's and an ATI. Instagram, Alex Frank, not underscore, and email, Alex3Frank at gmail.com. On tomorrow's show, Mike Petralia of CLNS Media. And join me to talk the Bearcats and the NIT. How about the Bearcats beating the 
beating Hofstra in the NIT in the NIT round of 16 on Saturday. They will take on Utah Valley or Colorado in the NIT quarterfinals later this week. I am not sure of when that game is going to be. At the time of this recording, the Bearcats next game had not been announced. It will be either Utah Valley or Colorado, and that will be a road game for Cincinnati. On Wednesday, we'll talk about the Bearcats in the NIT, what it means for next season, and something I've noticed about the Kansas Jayhawks, who I'm sure most of you are looking forward to the most playing in the Big 12 next year. FNA Josh Neighbors for a Thursday, locked on Big 12, and then Friday, we'll have the latest from spring practice. That's Russ Alford and I will do a live room potentially on Thursday to get the latest from spring practice. I'm Alex Friend for Locked On Bearcats. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Once again, Alex Frank for Locked On Bearcats. Have a great rest of your day.